It's my real special privilege and honor and, um, and luck that I met Lillian a few years ago at one of the lectures, courtship lectures, and in fact, I was using that courtship lecture, forgive me, Jerry, to advertise my courtship conference, <laughs> and, uh, and I was talking about the conference, and all of a sudden, the lady sitting in front of me, she was the first to say, oh, I'm interested, I will come. <laughs> And you know, so many people talk like this, I thought, oh, okay. And then she came to the Korcha conference in Seattle, and then many times after and before we met. And Lillian is so inspirational and so incredibly uh, knowledgeable about the period we're talking about and much more. Formally introducing Lillian, Lillian Boris Nemitz, uh, a writer, a poet, a Holocaust survivor, a person who taught for many years and actually is a published writer and has books published, but at the same time she's a very strong and powerful leader among many, many people who are still here with us, fortunately, and who are champions for peace. Because when you talk about Holocaust, you actually are a champion for peace. If people remember what happened then, they would not do it again. Without any further ado, Lillian, please. Thank you, Tatiana, for this very kind introduction. And hello, everyone. Uh, it's um, a tremendous honor and pleasure to see students, again, Korchak students. And I hope what, yes? Can you take a microphone? Uh, yes. And I hope that someday I'll be able to see a huge hall full of Korchak students because um, it's a very worthwhile education. Um, we're going to turn the clock back again today. Again, probably you've been learning uh, theory and all kinds of wonderful things about Korchak's Korchak pedagogy. And I'm turning back the clock somewhat. I do not have a PowerPoint presentation because I simply haven't organized it as such, so as yet. <laughs> as, so you'll have to bear with me as I look at my notes. And uh, what I'm going to, uh, where I've based my talk on today is this. Has anyone seen this? Ghetto Diary. That's the Ghetto Diary. Yeah. That's the ghetto diary. Yeah. I delved into it in depth because in it, I found the man. Uh, you know, what makes a man do what he did and be who he was. And so, in some way, this was extremely helpful, and I based some of my, uh, my, my talk on this. Um, this is a book, which I'm sure you're familiar with by now, How to Love a Child. Hello. And um, this is the picture that I saw of Korchak uh, when I visited Treblinka. It's no longer there, but it was there before, just at the entrance. And the very expression on this uh, photo it just was, it said everything to me. So without any further ado, um, these are reflections on Janusz Korczak, his heroism and its relevance to the 21st century as seen through the Warsaw Ghetto Diary. <clears throat> so in 
So, Janusz Korczak was and still is my hero. <clears throat> On one of my early trips to Poland, I made a pilgrimage to the Treblinka death camp where he and his 200 orphans perished. And as I, as before I entered the camp, I saw a blown up poster, which I already told you about right here, attached to a hut at the entrance. The photo of this poster can be also found in the opening pages of his ghetto diary. I stared into his eyes, mesmerized by their expression. If eyes alone can tell this grotesque story, his did. He looks out at the world with an expression of astonishment, shame, and disgust. His eyes penetrate your soul with the same. Small wonder. I entered Treblinka, the stony museum of death, reading inscriptions on the endless sea of stones, each depicting a lost Jewish community. No graves of my own family that perished there were to be found. Only one stone had the inscription of a person, Janusz Korczak and children, and the words never again in many languages. I ponder even now remembering these words, promises that have not been exactly fulfilled, were they? The Treblinka experience had never left me, just as Dr. Korczak stayed in my heart and mind. I'm humbly and indirectly connected with the sad and yet heroic history of Korczak and the Warsaw Ghetto. I presume you all know what the Warsaw Ghetto was. It is the children, Korczak wrote, who always have to carry the burden of history's atrocities. Indeed, and they still do. Korczak was also my father's hero, and it is from his stories that I found out what he stood for. Korczak and my father knew each other in the ghetto. My father was a policeman who picked children up off the streets, found them shelter, and food, <coughs> excuse me. He helped Korczak with food for his 200 orphans. At this point, <coughs> I would like to mention that what I have in common with Korczak is that we were both incarcerated in the Warsaw Ghetto at the same time. I was a child, he an elderly man, That is who I <laughs> looked like then, at that time, a child. <clears throat> I got close to him through an incident. The streets of the ghetto reeked of garbage and bodies of men, women, and children dying from disease and starvation. People's faces looked haunted by fear and deprivation. I saw this daily when my father took me to a secret school not far from where we lived. On one such day <clears throat> in the school, we were drilled in case someone knocked on the door to put away our learning materials into a box on which we sat and only leave paper and crayons on the table. It happened one day that there was a sharp knock. <clears throat> We children did as we were told and froze, sitting on our boxes. Two SS officers, the most dreaded of the Nazi army, black uniforms, stomped in and stared, started pushing our two lovely teachers around with the point of their revolvers, <clears throat> yelling loudly in broken Polish, then stomped out. We went home immediately the next day, when my father brought me to the school, to my chagrin, it was boarded up with words, Jules Verboten, school forbidden. <clears throat> that day, I and other children of the ghetto lost their rights to education. 
as we Jewish children lost our right to live. The janitor of the building ran out shouting that the teachers were sent to Paviak prison. I was in tears because I loved the little school. That was when my father took me by the hand and we walked onto Jenna Street and knocked on the door. A woman who was apparently an assistant to Korchak opened the door of a building which my father said was the orphan's home. She knew my father and let us in. She told us that the doctor was out getting food for the children. We sat down at tables strewn with books and papers. The children sat with us for a while, then ran around and played, behaving like normal children, going about their daily lives, seemingly oblivious to the outside horror and stench this place had an atmosphere of a world separate from the one we came from. It was Korchak's world where a sense of peace juxtaposed the chaos outside. After a while we left, oh thank you, <clears throat> and when on the street my father <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold <clears throat> on the street. My father pointed to a balcony in the same building where red geraniums grew. The only bit of color I could see in this dreary quarter. Thank you. <clears throat> Those were the flowers that Korcha cultivated just as he cultivated the children of the orphanage in a staunch pursuit of beauty against the stark ugliness in which we lived. Imagine the old doctor as he sits at night in a semi-dilapidated building on Jelna Street, hungry and tired, a glass of vodka, <clears throat> a piece of black bread, <clears throat> excuse me, a piece of black bread, blackout shades drawn, and Korchak bending over his diary in the dim light of a kerosene lamp. He will begin, he says, by digging a well. And I quote, I shall try to do something different with the story of my life. Perhaps the idea is good, perhaps it will work. Perhaps this is the right way. When you dig a well, you do not start at the deepest end. First you break up the upper layer, throw the earth aside, shovelful after shovelful, not knowing what is underneath. How many tangled roots? What other obstacles? How many stones forgotten buried by yourself and others? Roll up your sleeves. A firm grip on the shovel. Let's go. This final work of mine, I must do alone." End of quote. Korchak believed in honest discourse. Throughout the diary, he talks to himself and sometimes to God. And he analyzes both the questions and the answers. He wrote, you cannot even understand a child until you achieve self-knowledge. You yourself are a child whom you must learn to know, rear, and above all, enlighten." End of quote. How many of us know ourselves that way? Most of us have time to barely look deeply into our lives on the surface, but judge ourselves and others by the last event on the t at the top, and never asking the questions, never shoveling to the bottom of the problem thus coming up with erroneous conclusions and messages, harmful both to ourselves and to those we, we judge. In his diary, Korchak reveals his most profound self, which he uses as a blueprint for understanding the children. As I sit and read Korchak's ghetto diary, his words are constantly with me. For as I delve deeper and deeper into this candid 
and modest body of work. I understand more and more the meaning behind those words. Korchak's search for identity and is wanting to know himself and therefore deeply understand his pupils is the driving force behind all his work and especially the diary in his own words. In the diary, Korchak writes that he learns about the children <clears throat> by observing them, listening to them, watching their facial expressions, meaning behind their, the meaning behind their words and their body language, their likes, wants, and dislikes, what they say in their stories and diaries, he wants to know what each child is about in himself, not as he should be seen in the eyes of society. <clears throat> the orphanage becomes Korchak's laboratory, <clears throat> and his diary, the laboratory of his inner self, his childlike imagination, and his love for children. Korjak reaches out of time, deep into his mind, his soul, into his childhood, his fantasies of another planet called Ra, <clears throat> and, the good, and the good times of his youth, <clears throat> his parents, and the decrepitude of old age. Like Viktor Frankl in Men's Search for Meaning, when he was incarcerated in a camp, thoughts of family, memories, of good times, food, and well-being kept him going. As Korchak now sits at his desk, tired, hungry, and shabby, remembering the delicious sausage, peace, comfort, even luxury. At the same time, he's strong in his convictions that there is still beauty and goodness in the world. And just like Anne Frank in her diary. But he requires something else. <clears throat> Boredom, he writes, is the hunger of the spirit. Nostalgia, a thirst for water and for light, for freedom, for counsel, and an understanding ear to hear my lament, unquote. The diary goes on to reveal his truth, unlike many memoirs who foiled the truth by showing off their heroism and who they know. A man of today has matured, writes Korchak, but he has not become wiser or gentler. He writes about his first realization, the dichotomy of his religious identity. He considered himself a Pole and a Jew, but was conflicted when at the age of five his canary died. So he put it in, bo in a box and wanted to bury it, putting a cross on top of the grave. Korchak writes, the housemaid said no, because it was only a bird, something much lower than man, even to cry over it was a sin. Worse still, the janitor's son decided that the canary was Jewish, and so was I. I, too, was a Jew, and he a Pole, a Catholic. It was certain paradise for him, but not for me. I would end up, when I died, in a place which, though not hell, was nevertheless dark, and I was scared of a dark room, death, Jew, hell, a black Jewish paradise. Certainly plenty to think about, unquote. Korchak admits later on that his father and uncle works, worked hard to bridge the gap between Christians and Jews. At this point, I would like to read you part of a poem Korchak wrote in 1920, expressing his wish for children, for the children. I translated this poem into English in September 2009, A Teacher's Prayer. 
although gray and humble in your presence, Lord. I stand before you consumed with longing, whispering quietly. I state my wish in a voice of unflattering will. My eyes fire a plea beyond the clouds standing tall. I ask not for myself. Please endow the children with goodwill. Offer them help in their effort. Give their toil your blessing. Lead them along a path that is not the easiest, but most excellent. The poem speaks to me. I came to Canada and my life was not an easy path, but it was an enlightening one. For through hardship, I learned independence. I remember when we child survivors came to Canada and there was no understanding here or interest of our immediate past. And that was when I learned from someone like Korczak that it is not through avoidance of the past, but through facing it and dealing with it, could I ever free myself from the shackles of a terrible memory. The diary runs like an hourglass of Korczak's life and thought like the well that he digs till the spade reaches the bottom. Through the process of reading, I gain more and more respect for this man's thoughts and more and more understanding how this struggling human being exercises his will when at the end of his rope to keep the children's morale and his own alive. It takes a big, big heart with a will of gargantuan strength the phenomenal point of the diary is that never the word Holocaust or genocide is mentioned, and rarely the ghetto. Yet you feel the oppressive sliminess of the outside world creeping slowly into the home towards a tragic denouement. Kochak describes the following. The children moon about only the outer appearances are normal. Underneath lurks weariness, discouragement, anger, mistrust, resentment, and longing. The seriousness of their own diaries hurts. In response to their confidences, I share mine with them as an equal. Our common experiences, theirs and mine, mine are more diluted to watered down, otherwise the same." Unquote. In the meantime, for us, deportations begin. My mother, my little sister in her arms and I hanging onto her arm <laughs> for dear life are standing in a long line up to Umschlagplatz where the train for Treblinka death camp are waiting. We march along with the others. I cry, mommy, don't leave me. Suddenly arms scoop us out of the line into a building where we lie on the ground in the dark corridor while the line goes on without us. We survive one more time, not so, Korchak. And the children, who walked along the same street, in the same line as we did to their death. How can I, a survivor, not feel guilty? Towards the end of his diary, Korczak sees a German soldier through the window and he writes, I am watering flowers. My bald head in the window, what a splendid target. He has a rifle. What will he do if I nodded to him? Wave my hand in a friendly gesture. This was the last diary entry in the month of August 1942. The next day, they came for the orphanage. Though Korchak was offered a reprieve, he refused saying, I hate desertion, and besides, my children need me. Korchak wrote the following passage elsewhere at another time. What a tragedy is our contemporary life, and how shameful of this generation to be passing on to its children a chaotic world. This observation made by Korczak years ago is still so relevant in the 21st century. For what has changed? 
In closing, I would like to read you this poem called The Last Walk. But before that, I still have a paragraph. No, I think I read the poem first. <laughs> and still they march by Yella Corvin. They march to the Umschlagplatz, the doctor leads. Behind him, the tall abrasha with the flag. On its summer meadow green side, a spray of chestnut blossom. On the other side, bright white, a star of David, blue. The 200 orphans, oblivious to shouts and insults, march five abreast, singing, singing joyous hiking songs. Miss Stefa, the house mother, follows, the youngest in her arms. And still they march along a path of cirrus clouds, their tatters smoothed, touched with rainbow colors, glimmers on weightless bodies, changed to shimmers of celestial light. They march, they march. And indeed, Kochak is still with us today. In a world where children are still in war zones, hungry and without shelter. But thankfully today we know that we must, what we must do to fight for the welfare of children and their rights, the Korchak way. Thank you. Lillian, thank you so much. I, I just have a little oh, addition. Please. <laughs> I would just like to add that this diary was somehow miraculously saved by Igor Neverly, who writes that the day after Korchak and the children were deported, a red-haired boy brought him the package with the diary in it, which Korchak had apparently promised, Nemer promised, promised Neverly to send to him. Neverly took the package to the Polish orphanage, where the caretaker promised to brick it up under the eaves. After the war, it was given to the Polish Writers' Union, where it remained unpublished during the Stalinist years. After the thaw of 1956, Neverly included the diary in a publication of a four-volume anthology of Korshak's work. That's why I wanted to. Thank you. Thank you very much. Questions, comments, please. First, I have to get a Kleenex. <laughs> Excuse me. It's cold. Any questions? No questions? <laughs> not interested? <laughs> no, it's overwhelming. It's not because they're not. I, of course. Yes. Yeah. 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 It's always like that. It's hard to know where to pick up a thread from something like this. Comments? Anything which relates to what Lillian was talking about, what you learned during this institute and connecting, some connecting dots, Jane? So you said towards the end about how relevant it is to today. Um, the, the children have to carry the burden of history's atrocity. I'm just wondering just how you personally deal with that and um, what, your, what more thoughts you have about that. It's an interesting question. Uh, I have uh, faced my past and uh, probably fought with it for quite a while until I learned what to do with it. And uh, my way of dealing with it was to, uh, I go to schools as an outreach from the Holocaust Center, and I speak against racism. And uh, I write about it, uh, you know, I write and, and, and write poetry and so on. And I'm trying to make something out of something as senseless as, that was, as the Holocaust was. Um, and when I see children from various countries, you know, in camps, and even those who come here, 
uh, one of the reporters wrote, oh, you know, we have immigrants and the children, but the children, they are very resilient and they are very happily playing outside. But get into the head of those children, what they have been through. Does anybody bother? Only Korchak would. Who, who bothers to understand the children who came out of these war zones and what they suffered? And everybody describes everything on the outside. Children are f happily f uh, playing, and so everything's fine. No? Yeah, yeah, true. You know what? I wrote the name of Igor Nivelli, his uh, uh, secretary, and the one who published <coughs> a lot. If you want to read more, it's on the board. Does that answer your question? How do you deal with your past? <laughs> Each one has skeletons in the cupboard. Skeletons it's, in the cupboard. Uh, yeah, it's difficult to deal with them. Yeah, truly. Claire, do you want to say something? No, I'm just thinking about dealing with the past, and it's just work every single day. Yes, and... and do better and, and learn and grow and... And you know that you can't run away from it. Even though I remember when I came here and everybody said, oh, let it go, forget about it. How on earth do you do that? Yeah. You, you, can, you don't have to grovel over it. You don't have to examine you know, your navel every day. But I think you need to find a place for it and deal with it there. Hmm? Yeah? Uh, when you came to Canada, were you a child still? I was 12. 12. So um, how did they deal with that? Like, because uh, nowadays we talk about uh, PTSD and um, uh, the psychologist helping out kids. In those days, what, how were you welcomed? Well, that's an excellent, an excellent observation. And one of my pet injustices uh, that I talk about. Uh, I came uh, to Montreal and uh, I wanted to talk to someone about what I had experienced. Of course, I didn't know English very well yet, but I knew a little bit. So I told my school friend there, I said, um, I want to tell you something about Warsaw and Poland. And she looked at me with a strange look and said, let's go and play. What, what I'm trying to say is nobody listened. We talked about Korchak, who listened. Nobody listens. I mean, even now, people have no time. They are busy. Who listens to someone? But a child certainly needs that. So I had a very hard time. And as a result, I created another personality. The personality was the one I figured Canadians would like. I was, uh, I pretended to be happy-go-lucky and I had jokes and I, I just did my thing, but inside I had to cope at night with my nightmares and so on. Yes? At what point were you forced to, to face that, really face that past and accept that past? What happened? Well, that's also a good question because as time went on and my parents told me that I was I should act as though I were born in Canada because they didn't listen either. They were busy making a living. They didn't have time to listen to me and they never discussed it at home. Nothing, nobody. It was like, shh, you know, don't talk about it, forget it. Um, so I went on to my studies with which I struggled but eventually got through. Then I went on to get married and I had two wonderful children, still have. And then one day it hit me like a ton of bricks because things trigger memories, things that happen. And then I knew that I either coped with it or forget it, you know, if something would, I would end up in, I don't know where. And so I made a drastic move in my life 
And sometimes you have to destroy in order to create, to build. And that's what I did. And I found myself slowly, little by little. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I really, really admire what you did and what you do now. So I'm just wondering, like, I know you're like as a writer, how does writing help you to cope with the, all the like trauma? You know, there's a book called. I mean, I mean, I write because I feel compelled to write. Um, not, not necessarily only because I want to tell my stories, but because I have it in me to create these images and metaphors and things that I do in poetry also. Um, but there is a book called uh, Writing as Healing. I can't remember the author, but I think if you Google Writing as Healing, you'll get the author. And also, um, I tell you, when, when you have something on your mind and you take it from here and put it on the page, in, in, immediately you discharge some of the angst and you share it with your page and later on hope to share it with other people. Uh, Korchak was a great um, uh, 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 advise, advisor to write notes, to make notes and to write diaries. And uh, those were, from those notes he learned what his, how his students felt. You see? And, and the diaries and the you know, he knew exactly their mood and how they, uh, how they functioned. And the same, similarly in writing, when I taught writing, it was get a book, and every morning when you get up, jot down your dreams, jot down your thoughts. It doesn't matter what they are. And this is an incredible activity. So I would say whether you paint or play music or create music, or compose or play, whatever art you may be proficient in, that would do the same thing because that is a form of self-expression. Not self-expression as somebody wants you to express, but as you need to express. Yeah? You mentioned that um, your parents asked you not to talk about your, um, what you went through. What about your children? Did you talk to them? Did they ask questions? Well, <laughs> that is just it. My latest book talks about the transference of trauma to the gen it, it, it's intergenerational. You, you transfer your trauma to your children, and they may transfer your. It's written in the DNA, so you know it's it's bound to happen. Um, when my son was twelve, and he's a he's a most incredible human being who even at 12 already showed the, his huge soul and his goodness. And he listened. He listened. Like Korchak. And I was able to tell him a few things. I didn't tell him any terrible things, because he was probably too young. But I started with smaller things. Things that happened about the war and this and that. And he sat and listened. And it made my life so much better. Whereas my daughter, who was three years younger, I could not talk to her. Somehow, I don't think she wanted, because there are people who don't want to hear these things, unfortunately, still today. So, you know, you have to go with the flow. I, I was able to talk to him, but not to her. And um, today, uh, you know, later on when the Holocaust uh, Society um, had an uh, educational center, had conferences, my son would come with me to introduce me and to talk about how he felt with his mother being the survivor. So he was the one later on. So somehow it created a positive attitude on, on his part and a good relationship between us. Yeah. 
Simone Veil, who was a, a, a politician, a writer also from France, and uh, she was. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't Simone, hear. Simone Veil. Oh, yes, Simone, Simone Veil, yeah. yeah, yeah. And she was saying that when she came back from the camp, uh, people looked at her with pity and they would buy her clothes, and she said, That's not what I need. I wanted somebody to help me with whatever happened to me. Yeah, psychologically. So, yeah, so uh, when um, you talk to students or if you meet people that come uh, from uh, war zones, are you capable of telling them what, um, or, or to help them is into the society? Yes, very much so. I, I talk to students from various cultures and immigrants and um, then they ask the questions and they really, I think the young students are so wonderful and so full of empathy. It isn't pity that a survivor wants, it's, it's um, empathy. There is this concept of an enlightened witness which was described by Alice Miller who studied under Jung and wrote books like um, Unto, um, You Shall Not Be Aware, Breaking the Wall of Silence, The Drama of the Gifted Child, wonderful. That's, I found myself in those books. And, um, you know, you, you just do what you, what you feel that you, you, you need to do to tell your story but not to seek any kind of pity. Nobody wants that. Just understanding. And this is what, I don't know if the world has gone to the point where very few people seem to be sensitive to things that are happening or have compassion. This is why we do, this is why Korchak looms so big. I mean, look at him. If that isn't just a complete, you know, this is compassion, this is understanding. Not pity. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Who was that person that said an enlightened witness? Enlightened witness? Oh, I'm sorry. I, 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 went, I tried to answer the question and bring something else up. Um, so Alice Miller um, feels that if, if you have a problem and you, you, you have no one to listen, no one who will listen, but then you find someone who will listen with compassion and understanding, not pity, but who will truly absorb your angst and understand what it's about and where it comes from. Then this, and then you tell your story to this person, this person becomes a witness to your story and becomes an enlightened witness because they are capable of understanding it. Like Korchak was. Korchak was an enlightened witness to hundreds of children's stories. And I would, I, I, I really, I wish there were more Korchaks in the world. I mean, it's not just about having a psychiatrist. I, I, psycho psychiatry completely failed understanding children of war in North America. This is a proven fact because it wasn't the experience in North America and they couldn't understand. So they, someone like me, uh, like, you know, I would go and tell, tell him about the Warsaw Ghetto because it disturbed me where I came from. And he was doing yoga. I mean, he, he had no understanding. And then he kept on asking about my, what's your relationship with your mother? <laughs> Will, do you have good sexual relationships with your husband? I mean, it has nothing to do with what I needed him to, to. He couldn't be the enlightened witness. Do you know what I mean? We were talking about, Lila, and about the culture in North America, which is, how are you doing? I'm great. No one wants to hear how you are really doing. No, because and Jerry, Jerry, sorry, Jerry came up with something the other 
a while ago, where he said that he was, somebody asked him how he was doing, he said very badly, and they said that's good. <laughs> Story, a colleague of mine at UW, a professor, he was passing by his manager and she said, how are you doing? Uh, and he said, oh, I'm okay, but my wife was diagnosed with cancer. Oh, that's great. Right. Uh, and she passed by and next day she wrote a message to him saying, you know, it's just dawned on me. You said cancer? Did I hear you right? And I said, great, how horrible of me. At least she remembered, yeah? But that's, that's the culture. We are all on the surface. No one wants to go deeper and heal. Is it fear? Uh, I think, it, no, it's not fear. It's lack of empathy. It's lack of uh, sensitivity. It's uh, individualistic culture, which doesn't want to accept and embrace someone else. If I'm happy, I, I'm comfortable in my little bubble or a little bigger bubble, I think I'm okay. I don't want to take your pain because it's too much for me. I think uh, this inability to embrace a bigger world, but when people have it, I think it's a huge talent. Well. But I think, yeah. Yeah, but I think for educators and anyone who is working in the field of helping professions, it's an absolute must to have. Yes. Otherwise, uh, you can't work in this field if you can't embrace somebody's Absolutely. pain. Yeah. So we need more. We need we need enlightened witnesses. When because like Korchak, he was an enlightened witness. So we we cannot just look out there. We have to look in our, into ourselves as he did in this diary. There are many more things I couldn't quote, but he, he uses himself as a blueprint uh, for understanding, for, for, this, for, for looking at life through the eyes of someone who wants to make life better for children and for others too. And, 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 um, he also was a child, you know, he had a, he had a childlike thing in himself, you know. He was able to write these children's stories, to put down his, his um, fantasies, um, and that's why he was able to help children to understand the world around them and let them create their own ideas, their own who they are, to be who they are not who they are expected to be.